So welcome everybody. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting three incredible individuals who will share their perspectives on communication access barriers that deaf, hard of hearing, ASL, American Sign Language communities experience. We also have the pleasure of two wonderful interpreters, ASL English interpreters joining us on this occasion, Andrea and Jessica. Thank you all for being here. Joining us is therefore Corina Gutierrez, who is a community representative and advocate, currently uh, works as the director for community advocacy at the State of New Mexico Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Persons. She is also currently serving as a board member for the New Mexico School for the Deaf Alumni Association. We have joining us as well, Jenny Rodriguez, who is the Director of Healthcare Interpreting Program at the National Technical Institute of the Deaf at Rochester Institute of Technology. And she is in the process of completing her doctoral dissertation examining access to effective communication in US hospitals. Last but not least, um, we have um, Dr. Barbara Schaefer, who is a professor in, as well as a director of the Signed Language Interpreting Program in the Department of Linguistics at the University of New Mexico. Her research interests include the grammaticalization of signed languages, as well as intersubjectivity in discourse and in interpreted interactions. Again, I also want to thank and welcome Andrea and Jessica, our two ASL English interpreters, without whom this exchange, this roundtable will not even be possible. So thank you all for being here. And Corina, um, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zoe. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this roundtable discussion. As was mentioned, my name is Corina Gutierrez. Um, I know that Zoe did briefly introduce me. I will tell you that I do work for the state of New Mexico's Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing as the Director of Community Advocacy. And my department is actually quite large and um, I won't go into all of the details of what we provide, but what I can add is that we focus, I also am on the Parent and Family Advisory Council for the University of New Mexico Hospitals. And that's also been something that I've gotten great fulfillment from. As a deaf individual, I do use ASL interpreters to communicate every day. And the interpreters who interpret for me also interpret for the audience as well, which is why they are ASL English interpreters. And with that, Jenny, will you introduce yourself? Sure, I think Zoe did a great job introducing me, but um, nice to meet everyone. I am out here in Rochester, New York, teaching at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. I teach in the Certificate in Healthcare Interpreting Program, which is a um, one-of-a-kind program teaching interpreters how to specialize in healthcare interpreting. Um, very rare in our field to have something like that. And I've been teaching for the past 10 years, interpreting for 20. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. So that's me, I'll pass it over to Barb. I'm um, Barb Schaefer. I'm the director of the Sign Language Interpreting Program at UNM. Um, I'm also, um, we are an accredited uh, signed language interpreting program, as is Jenny's program, and um, I'm the vice president of the accrediting body for signed language interpreting programs in the, in North America, and I also work on the side as an ASL English interpreter, primarily in legal, medical, and mental health settings. Wonderful. Thank you for all introducing yourselves. So with that, let's get going on our discussion. We're going to be talking primarily about the healthcare field. And as Jenny explained, her role and responsibility is to educate um, and Barbara as well. 
And for myself, I'm a deaf patient who goes to many healthcare providers and has to use ASL English interpreters for my everyday communication needs. So we all will be able to provide a unique perspective here. Healthcare providers submit requests for interpreters. And I'm wondering if Jenny or Barbara, um, if you receive an assignment to interpret in a healthcare setting, for me as the deaf patient and you as the interpreter, our roles are very different. I have preferred interpreters. There are specific interpreters that I would like to attend my various appointments. So when you receive a request, you don't typically see the name of the patient initially. So, you know, you make your decision about accepting that request based on time and availability. And I know I'm kind of going off track here, but I will make my point. For healthcare providers, I am wondering what issues you see and what communication barriers you see for those who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and I would also like to add the deaf blind community as well, because they experience their own unique set of barriers. Barbara? One thing that um, I see still happening in 2021 that's kind of um, unfortunate, you can't pick your the doctor that you want to pick, right? The Americans with Disabilities Act is a great law, but it doesn't cover every provider. And so sometimes deaf people want to go to a smaller provider. They may want to go to a, you know, a complementary care provider, and they're not all obligated under ADA to provide interpreters. And some of them might just say, no, you can't have an interpreter. So that drives me a little batty still that, that deaf people can't go to any doctor they choose to go to. Um, I also think that um, the, the rise of video remote interpreting, particularly in healthcare, and I'm speaking before COVID, um, didn't take into account that um, a, a large percentage of our community has vision issues as well and can't A, hear an interpreter, and may not be able to see an interpreter two-dimensionally on a screen. So I think those are two things that I see coming up quite a bit still. I would agree um, with, I just wanted to agree with Barb about the issues with seeing providers. I think that there is a misconception about I think that smaller providers have a misconception that they can get away with not providing interpreters. But the part of the law that says that um, it has to be a burden, a financial burden to be able to get out of it, uh, typically there is no way for them to prove that it's a financial burden. So if a deaf person were to file suit, they would likely win. Uh, so, But I don't think that people are aware of that. And mm -hmm. act uh, 1557 of the Americans, um, sorry, the Affordable Care Act, Section 1557 states specifically that the providers have to give primary consideration to the deaf person regarding the auxiliary aid that they feel they need. So if the hospital ends up picking something that does not work for the deaf patient and they complain, again, they will likely win. One of the one of the biggest issues I've seen that's still a major problem is just hearing people not understanding how ASL works, um, assuming that it's English on the hands. And so there's this assumption that all deaf people should be able to lip read and write notes back and forth. And that's a gross um, misinterpretation of what ASL is. Um, and so there's this just assumption that you don't have to provide an interpreter. And I think that that's something that continues today. Mm -hmm. Yes, I absolutely agree with your comments. In my job, we work with healthcare providers. And for healthcare providers, typically what it looks like a big organization and that are coupled by Title II, of course, and, and then Title III is 
private entities or smaller business practices. Um, but I work with all of those healthcare providers to talk about what their obligations are, whether it's Title II or Title III. And my goal is to provide education and partnership because I don't want to be the bad cop. And sometimes I have to be because there is a refusal to cooperate and to collaborate together to find a solution. Um, and those organizations are responsible for providing the accommodations that are necessary for our deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind communities, whatever they may be. So that could be an ASL English interpreter. Some deaf individuals can write back and forth and communicate quite well, and that is their preference. But generally, well, I, it's a time-saving measure to have an ASL English interpreter. And I know that doctor's appointments are really shuffling people through, and that also requires someone who has the patience to work with the deaf community and extend that typical 20 minute doctor's appointment to have perhaps 30 or 45. Um, but it does take time to allow for that communication to occur. And especially when it's occurring through a third party. For those who are deaf blind, it definitely extends the amount of time necessary for an appointment when you're using an ASL English interpreter. When you're dealing with vision loss, or if someone is completely blind, they may be relying on tactile sign language interpreting, which is feeling the signs on someone's hands. And then you'll have to take the time to hear what is being said and to respond and have that, again, facilitated through the interpreter. So there's a lot of turn taking in that process and it requires more time. For those who are hard of hearing, generally their first language is spoken English and they may not know sign language which means they may require an accommodation like an assistive listening device, an FM system, or different apps which are available on mobile devices. There are speech to text apps and all sorts of different accommodations that could be necessary for any of those community members. Barbara? It's a really interesting point. Um, Jenny, you brought it up first. It is difficult to prove hardship, the burden, but a lot of people don't have time to wait for educating grievances, a lawsuit, right? If you have if you have a lump on your breast, you really don't wanna wait through a lawsuit, you know, all of the, the, you know, the legal machinations. Could you, Jenny, could you tell us a little bit more about Title II, Title III, or Karina, you both brought up the ADA, I brought up the ADA. Maybe some of the people here don't know as much about the ADA as we do and what Title II and Title III each cover one or the other of you. I can start and then maybe Karina can continue. <laughs> so um, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, protects all individuals from discrimination. Title II is for public entities. So um, government buildings, um, any kind of government services, public hospitals, uh, they're all required to provide auxiliary aids, which is um, assistance, like, like Karina said, assistive listening devices, um, sign language interpreters, and so on and so forth. For Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, it is for private businesses. Um, so like Karina was saying, smaller doctor's offices, for example. Um, so anyone who receives federal funds are required to provide auxiliary aids. So whether uh, under section 1557, whether you're a title three entity or a title two entity, you, if you receive federal financial assistance from um, centers of Medi um, Medicare system, CMS, you are required to provide those auxiliary aids. So there used to be a grand difference between title two and title three. But now with section 1557, it adds teeth to the law so that you can actually prosecute. But like Barb said, people just want to see the doctor. There's this major, there's extra effort and work that goes into trying to get accommodations that deaf people should not have to deal with. <laughs> but Karina, do you want to add anything to the Title II, Title III that I missed? No, I think you said it perfectly and thank you for that explanation. 
um, title of Title II and Title III. You're spot on. Um, my experience here working within the state of New Mexico is that oftentimes those smaller practices are denying those accommodations because they're under 15 employees. But that is a huge misunderstanding. Title I is about employment. So a deaf individual who works for a place of employment that has under 15 employees may not need to provide the same type of accommodations. But Title III has nothing to do with the number of employees within your business. If you own a private business and you are providing medical services for any patient, which could be deaf, deaf blind, or hard of hearing, and when they want to access your services, you have an obligation to provide accommodations specific to that person's needs. So it doesn't have anything to do with the number of employees within your business because that's a separate provision under the ADA. And so that does require some clarification often. And we do work within these private practices to talk about which uh, financial burden, which Jenny already touched on, and to let them know that um, we can request, you can request a tax write-off for providing those accommodations, which many business owners aren't aware of. So using a tax write-off as incentive is sometimes helpful as well. Barbara? One additional thing, you know, we talk about burden, but we talk about it typically on for the provider, but yes, that the deaf person often has the burden of educating and then sometimes has the additional burden of there being some hard feelings even after they've explained it. And you know, not every deaf person has Karina's wealth of knowledge and can explain the titles of the ADA, the Affordable Care Act, things like a tax write-off and all of that. So very often um, providers are left with perhaps a little bit of a ugh, uncomfortable feeling that they think they're going to be spending money on a deaf person. And, and, and that can make it hard, I think, to probably build rapport with your patient then when the, when the deaf person appears at their appointment. Yeah, Jenny, I saw your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Barb said about the angsty feelings. Good <laughs> if, word. If the deaf patient decides to go the legal route and sue, then uh, part of my doctoral dissertation, I actually spoke with a lawyer, Michael Schwartz, who um, litigates a lot of these types of claims. And he said that unfortunately what ends up happening is if the deaf person sues and they have no intention of going back to that doctor, they're just making a point that this was not right and I want them to, I want some kind of repercussions to happen. Um, the, the judge will find that they don't have standing, right? And so it, the, the case gets thrown out and they're, they're not ap actually able to continue because they have no intention of going back to that provider. You have to prove that you will go back to the provider for you to actually win the case, which again, who would want to go back to a provider who, <laughs> who was discriminating against them? So. And I'd like to emphasize that for our deaf, deaf and deafblind communities, we experience a lot of oppression. I have experienced oppression my entire life. I have less access to language because I do not hear. And so an audience who can hear, for those people who can hear, you have had the privilege of that access your entire life, whereas we have often struggled to understand what has been going on around us as we grow up. And the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. So their foundation of oppression was present prior to then for so many years that um, actually the amount of people who follow the provisions of the ADA are very few, it is not 100%. And so it requires a lot of fight, a lot of educational efforts to tell people that it is their responsibility to provide those accommodations and it's exhausting. 
And it, I get worn out from this. And even as someone who works professionally in advocacy, this is a daunting task. And in the real world, in the dream world, everything would be accessible. And it would just be an automatic part of the landscape to have that accessibility built in. So, I mean, that's something we hope for in the future, maybe 2030 or in 50 years, who knows, but that's the dream world. And that's the goal is to get to that universal design where everything is available and accessible to us. But I think it's important to keep in mind that my experience is very different than yours. You have not been in my you don't have my lived experience and the hearing privilege that people have is quite different than the daily struggle to access information that the deaf community endures. So that's something that I'd like you to keep in mind when someone asks for an accommodation, please provide it expediently. I mean, as interpreters, I'm also wondering what your experience is as well, interpreting for deaf patients and seeing this type of oppression and seeing the struggle to provide advocacy and access. Yes, I'm thinking when I actually get called, they're providing the service. Right, because that means that they're doing something right if they've called me to show up. So typically, I don't see any of the problems. Um, I only hear about them from my deaf friends after the fact. I deal with things like, you know, them not knowing where to stand and saying things like "tell her, tell her," um, not speaking directly with a deaf person. So, um, you know, in those cases we mediate that with the deaf person deciding whether they want to uh, take control of the conversation and educate the provider if they want us to do it. But if, if I'm there, they called an interpreter. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's like, yay, we're there. That's step one. It's, it's interesting though, Still, there are so many things. Um, you encounter situations where they're not talking to the deaf patient, they're talking to the hearing family member about the deaf person, or um, they've decided that remote interpreting will work for whatever reason, um, and it may not work with that deaf person. Um, yeah, there's still a number of issues. And COVID, pros and cons, right? COVID has increased access in certain ways and then made it harder in certain ways. Um, uh, I'm getting more remote requests for more rural medical assignments than ever before. So that's a good thing. But then on the flip side, I think people are, are defaulting to remote interpreting more than they were prior to COVID. And that's very often not something that is preferable for the deaf person and or not even accessible. It's, it's, there's a very big difference between accessing a spoken language interpreter through remote interpreting and accessing an ASL English interpreter that you have to be able to see when you're in certain positions on exam tables and you know all of that stuff. So there's still, yeah, a lot of issues. Even if we do get in the door, there are still a lot of issues. I will say that I think sometimes New Mexico is a, we're in New Mexico, Karina and I are, um, we sometimes are a little tiny bit ahead in that New Mexico is, commonly referred to as a constitutionally bilingual state. So there's more of an acceptance of interpreters here. So for example, it's de facto no big deal that deaf people serve on juries here. Deaf people can be the four person of the jury. Deaf people are four person of grand juries here because we're constitutionally bilingual. Um, but the, the issues continue always. Jenny? I was just I was just seeing that there was a, a comment, but I will. Um... There's quite a few comments. Yeah, there are several, so I, I will try not to look at that yet. And like, <laughs> um, I totally lost my train of thought. Mm -hmm. I saw one comment that was talking about TTY phones. And I would like to mention that because 
that technology is now quite old comparatively. And so many people are using more modern technology as advances have, have really been great in recent years. So to go back to discussing about when the pandemic hit, it hit our community especially hard, particularly for the deaf blind group as well because of issues with telehealth and having interpreters on a screen, but deaf blind individuals not being able to access that 2D interpreting and having issues with being able to have support um, for that interpreting, having support service providers. There was a lot of discussion about how to make that happen safely because there were concerns about close contact and individuals becoming ill. And what do we do when we need to have people in close contact and touching one another for language to occur? So of course we did work around that with wearing um, PPE, making sure people were vaccinated. And as the numbers of COVID decreased, it was more safe for patients to be closer to their interpreters, to have interpreters use that tactile touch signing. For individuals who have Usher syndrome and have tunnel vision, they automatically need more socially distanced interpreters because of where their field of vision is. But I know it was very difficult for our community to adapt to that technology. Here we don't have widespread high-speed internet. The cost of that access to internet is very expensive and many of our community members couldn't afford it. Many were trying to utilize services through their phone on a very tiny screen. It was difficult for them to see. Often interpreters were not included in the telehealth link and providers were saying that because of HIPAA and privacy concerns, they weren't allowed to include a third party of an interpreter in those appointments. And so for, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a great struggle for our community to access healthcare. We also had the issue of masks and being able to understand someone. Using masks removes most of the facial expressions and the abilities to see what someone is saying. And many people um, were not comfortable removing their masks, of course, and issues again with speech reading because it's not English. Many deaf people don't understand speech reading, but then having those masks on limited the options for our community to be able to understand what was going on around them. So that was a great experience that we went through in trying to work with interpreters during COVID for tactile communication. Um, I know a lot of people were very concerned about becoming ill. Interpreters were concerned about interpreting in hospitals and contracting COVID. So that was a major issue we faced. Jenny. One thing I noticed as uh, interpreters is all of a sudden, many of us realized, hey, I don't know that I know sign language because all of a sudden deaf people are wearing masks and we don't realize how much we rely on, on lip reading. And it was like this whole new world where we had to get used to seeing sign language in a different way so that we were actually able to understand what was happening. Um, yes. <laughs> now I brought props because I realized spoken language interpreters might not have seen these. You're so smart. Some of the things we use sign language interpreters. So, so sign language interpreters might have these handy dandy little masks, but nobody else does, which is problematic. Some hospitals have done great things where they actually put them in the supply chain so that anyone in the hospital can request them. But during COVID at the height of it, there were supply shortages and so nobody really had them. But this is the communicator mask. It has a very teeny small hold for your lips. It's what was used most often. It was the only one that was FDA approved, but then new ones came out. And now this is my favorite one. I have to show everybody. It's fantastic. It's my favorite as well. See, you can see everything. Um, it's the bend shape, bend shape mask. It's more expensive, but it works beautifully. Um, deaf people have said they love that one because it, it's still annoying to have to wear a mask, but they can actually see the face um, because so much of sign language uses facial, most of, much of our grammar is on the face. And so it makes it very difficult to have this entire area blocked off. Um, 
Yeah. Put the Ben shape in the chat box because at least one person asked about it. I agree, it's by far my favorite mask. We're almost out of time. I wanna say one last thing too that we haven't really touched on with respect to COVID and with respect to telehealth. I think very often um, hearing people who don't work with deaf people on a regular basis don't think about the platform that's being used as well. Um, I think most of us have a strong feeling that, you know, we like Zoom or we like this or we like that. Um, they're not all equally accessible if you're deaf or hard of hearing. Um, I know for myself, I get, I find it very challenging to interpret over Google, be it Google Hangout or Google Meet. That doesn't happen so much in healthcare, but that happens in the courts a lot. Um, so yeah, keeping the platform in mind as well. Can you pin one person? Can you pin three people? All of these things are, are issues that um, someone just said captioning. Yeah, all of these things are issues that, that we need to keep growing and learning from. Um, we can use this pandemic to help us provide better service for everybody. So um, thank you all of you for being here. Uh, those of you who joined us from the audience, as well as our roundtable discussants and uh, ASL English interpreters. Again, without you, this would not have been possible. I am going to just uh, say thank you and goodbye for now, since we have run over a little bit, but not by much. And we look forward to having another wonderful engaging exchange in November. Thank you everybody for today and bye for now.